It's been a while since we got together on Wednesday just because of circumstances being the same. We wanted to share some other resources with you, but here we are. It is Wednesday. And uh, if it's like uh, it is here for you guys over there in the Nashville area, it is really rainy. So happy for a roof today. But well, we want to jump back into, um, and we covered some of this material with the link that I asked you to watch last week. Uh, we want to jump back into this notion of uh, the God who is present. And you'll remember some time ago, I'm kind of coming to the end of this, uh, but some time ago we talked about um, how in the book of Exodus particularly, God uh, gives us his name, I am who I am. And that this is tied to the notion of God hearing the cry that comes out of the darkness and answering that cry and acting to redeem in the midst of that darkness. And we've talked about that in all manner of places throughout the Bible, Uh, most particularly as we uh, last got together in person, or not in person, but um, screen to screen virtually instead of sharing a resource from someone else. Uh, We talked about how that frames the story of Jesus that Jesus' story in the Gospels is closely tied to this theme of God hearing the cry, God answering the cry, God bringing redemption. So there's this notion of crying out. And uh, we want to talk about what it means to be a people that follows this sort of God. If this is who God is, God who is present is the God who hears and answers the cry that comes out of the brokenness. What does it mean to follow this sort of God. So if what we've seen in the Psalms is true. Well, last week the video I asked you to watch from the Bible Project was about Psalm 8 uh, where the cry comes out of the darkness and God reveals himself as the one who answers that cry. Um, if what we see in the book of Exodus is true, if what we see in the book of Genesis is true where um, particularly blood or Abel's blood cries out from the ground and God answers that bringing justice into the situation. He confronts Cain out of that um, situation. If, if what we see in the book of Revelation is true, if what we see uh, in the Gospels is true, what does it mean for us to follow this kind of God, the one who hears the cry, who answers the cry in the darkness? And the short answer to that, um, as we've been kind of looking through the book of Isaiah, uh, is that we are the ones who are also attentive to those cries that come out of the darkness. Now, Sometimes, we've talked about this before as well, uh, we will be the ones who do the crying. It's kind of what Romans 8 is about. Um, In Romans 8, uh, Paul takes up this Exodus language. He's drawing us back into that Exodus narrative. In Romans 8, everyone is crying out. We cry out in the uh, present sufferings. The earth cries out under the present sufferings. The spirit cries out along with us. And then by the end of the chapter, God is faithful to answer those cries in a way that um, that overcomes the darkness from which we cry. So there is a sense in which we cry out. And we always want to be the people who are characterized as crying out to God from the darkness. That is, we want to have a keen awareness that the way things are now are oftentimes uh, not right. They're broken. We are in the midst of this darkness as we live in between the times, between the making of the promise of the coming of the kingdom of God and the fulfillment of that promise. It's in process, but it's not finished. And so in the darkness, we are the ones that cry out how long. We are the ones that cry out that is not right, knowing that God hears those cries and that God is faithful to answer those cries. And so uh, coming at it from one direction, from the Romans 8 direction, we are the ones who do that. Uh, But going back to Isaiah and looking at the way this plays out, particularly in the Gospels, um, I want to also say that we are the ones who are attentive to the cries of others in this world. We are the ones who hear the cries of others and then join in with God in acting on their behalf. And so um, that crying that comes out of the darkness is not often, or not always anyway, a religious sort of thing. Sometimes if you live long enough, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you go to church every Sunday, whether you've never gone to church in all your life, whether you're a devout believer or an atheist or, or anything in between, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, if you live long enough, you are going to um, come smack up against the brokenness of the world. There's going to come this moment in your life where something happens and, and just the, uh, the enormity of the darkness, of the not-rightness of the way things are. Um, it's going to come 
face to face with you. I mean, maybe it's um, maybe it's a cancer diagnosis, maybe it's unemployment, maybe it's unfaithfulness, or maybe a loved one or or a family member or a friend hurts you. I, it could be any of a million things. Uh, but we all reach that moment where we look at the world and say, "There's got to be something better than this." And and in our pain, in those moments, we uh, maybe not to God, but we cry out. Um, it's an expression of grief and and mourning and the brokenness of the world. And so uh, one of the messages that we hear is that God hears those cries the same as he hears the cries of the faithful. That God is in the business of hearing the cries of his image bearers, regardless of who they are. And in Jesus, he's ultimately acting to bring about redemption for those who have been faithless, which, by the way, of all of us, the surest way to tell if you are um, a broken sinner is to take your pulse if you have one you are that's what God hears our cries and so we want to attune our ears to hear those cries going on around us and uh, as a way of kind of giving shape to this conversation one of the things we might do is we might look at uh, the sorts of themes that come up in uh, particularly the book of Isaiah sorry for the close up I just got to set up a little bit uh, particularly in the book of Isaiah. And um, Isaiah has done a lot to shape the way that we should understand the kingdom of God, the way we should understand the kingdom of God, the way Matthew understands the kingdom of God. And, and Luke, particularly those two, but also Mark and John, understand the kingdom of God. They um, oftentimes would tie what Jesus was doing back into the sorts of things that Isaiah, and of course Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the others, and the, the poets of the Psalms as well, um, the sorts of things they were saying uh, to give to give shape and context to what Jesus was doing, and so we actually could talk about uh, the gospel, and this may be what we talk about for the next few weeks. I just want to kind of give, give an overview, and an introduction to it. Now, um, we could talk about rightfully so the gospel according to Isaiah, because Isaiah looks forward to a period of time where God will come and establish himself as king. That is the reign of God. The, the kingdom of God will come. And uh, in Isaiah's vision of the future, the kingdom of God will look a certain way. Certain things will characterize the kingdom of God when it comes. So he's looking to the future. He's looking to the time when the kingdom of God is established. And of course, the Gospels is where John first and then Jesus come in and says, the kingdom of God is here. It's time to repent. Um but they are only bringing into fulfillment, into fruition, what it is that Isaiah was looking for. And so the question is, what sort of things, when, when God shows up in the darkness, um, when God begins to answer the cry of those who cry out in that darkness, when God brings redemption, what are the sorts of things that characterize uh, that presence and that action and that redemption? And uh, Isaiah has a lot of things to say about that. And so one of the places we might turn uh, to look for just a few minutes today is Isaiah 61. And just, just listen to the language. We're going to look at just a couple of places in Isaiah today, and then we, we can go from there. We've already kind of talked about this in Isaiah um, 7 through 9. We kind of already talked about this in Isaiah 36 through 40. Uh, where against the wicked kings like Ahaz and the Israelite king and the Syrian king and the Assyrian king and Hezekiah, who was a good king but inept, um, Babylonian king, uh, against the failures of those kings, God said he would come in those two texts and establish his way of doing things. It would be characterized by righteousness and it would be characterized by justice and peace and those sorts of things. He would get right what those kings had gotten wrong. Uh, but the theme is also continued in Isaiah 61. Uh, we're just going to start reading verse 1 and just listen to the sort of language that it uses, okay? Uh, the Spirit of the Lord, Yahweh, is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and liberation to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and our God's day of vengeance, to comfort all those in mourning, to give those in mourning in Zion, to give them a head wrap instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh to show his glory. 
and they shall build the ancient ruins. They shall erect the former deserted places. They shall restore, restore the devastated cities, the deserted places of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall be your farmers and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of Yahweh. You'll be called servers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of nations. You shall boast in their riches. Instead of your shame, a double portion. And instead of insult, they will rejoice over their portion. Therefore, they will take a double portion in their land. They shall possess everlasting joy. For I, Yahweh, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. And I will faithfully give their reward. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their descendants will be known among their nation and their offspring in the midst of the peoples. And all those who see them shall recognize them, that they are descendants whom Yahweh has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in Yahweh. My being shall shout in exultation in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. A bridegroom adorns himself with a, a head wrap like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewelry. For as the earth produces its sprout, as a garden makes its plants sprout, so the Lord Yahweh will make righteousness sprout in praise before all the nations. And so just in that reading, pay attention to the way that he characterizes this. It's, 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 there's going to come a time uh, where there is this, this servant, this person, we might even say uh, this priestly or kingly figure because they've been anointed by the Spirit and, you know, the Messiah. Christ. It's a term for the anointed. When you've anointed kings, you anointed priests, someone who has been given a commission by God. Um, they've been anointed up in the first few verses by the Spirit of God to bring uh, good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the release of captives, the liberation of those who are bound. And Isaiah is speaking here into a context where um, uh, those who are being oppressed, those who are in prison, those who are bound, uh, this isn't an exile type context. This is um, around the time the Assyrians are dominant on the stage, the Babylonians are dominant on the stage. Isaiah has been talking about them going off into exile, being prisoners. And so this liberation, this freedom is in that context. It, someone is coming anointed, uh, kind of charged, given the vocation to bring this about or to announce that God is is doing this. And he sneaks in there at the end of verse 2, this, the language of, um, just by the way, historical context, Jubilee. Uh, the day of the Lord's favor that this uh, servant, this anointed one, is announcing is, is the Jubilee. That was a reference to Jubilee. And Jubilee was... Um, that year, every 50 years, you can find it in Leviticus 25 if you want to take a look at it, where um, they begin the year by proclaiming liberty, let liberty ring throughout the land. This is on the Liberty Bell. Uh, it's a quote from Leviticus 25. And in that year, uh, the land was to rest. All the land that you'd accumulated outside of kind of your family land was to be given back to those that that you had accumulated it from. All of those that were enslaved to you were to be set free. All of the debts were to be forgiven. It was a, a moment of great redemption for a great many people because in their day there wasn't a real estate market. If you sold land it was because something had happened and you needed money or you couldn't work the land anymore. So it was an act of desperation to sell land. And so to get your land back in the year of Jubilee is a way of securing the future of your family. Same thing with slavery. In the, the olden days you, you didn't um, oftentimes in Israel just find yourself in slavery because of um, the way you were born or skin color or many of the concepts that we find in the modern world with slavery. Rather, you uh, sold yourself into slavery because you uh, couldn't afford something. But it was an act of desperation. It was an exchange of your services, your, your life for uh, your master to care for you. And so to be set free was an act of Liberation, an act of redemption. Same thing with debts. You didn't take out loans just to go on vacation in the ancient world. If you, you borrowed money from somebody, it was an act of desperation. So this was a moment of redemption. Jubilee was this great moment um, of redemption. And by the time uh, Isaiah comes along, Daniel after him, um, 
there was a sense that there would be this, this grand jubilee moment in the future. Uh, this jubilee of jubilees, all of these other practices of jubilee were pointing towards, they, they were pushing toward this moment in the future where God would act in a way to decisively redeem, to set things right. And this is what Isaiah 61 is about. And so in Isaiah 61, what happens is um, when God comes and does his thing, what it looks like is it looks like redemption, like freedom, liberation is the word for those who are oppressed, those who are uh, in bondage. It looks like good news being proclaimed to, uh, the Hebrew word there is anawim, the anawim. They are literally the pressed down ones. Um, they are the ones who are in the bottom of the pile and they get stepped on and every time they start to get their feet um, under them something or someone comes along and kicks their feet back from under them there at the end of their rope they are the hopeless ones and so it looks like good news being proclaimed to those who are on the bottom of the pile and then after verse 2 he goes on this this extended uh, description it's really beautiful about how um, our mourning will turn to joy the cities that have been destroyed and, and the deserted places that have been given up, they will be rebuilt and repopulated and they will restore what they formerly had. And all of the loss and all of the pain that comes with that loss will be addressed. And so comfort will flow out of that situation. And then it goes on to talk about this um, scenario of plenty where everyone has enough and righteousness and justice will overflow there and rather than conflict between the nations there is this kind of cooperation there is Israel in the language of Isaiah 61 serving as the priest and the nations coming alongside to work with and, and for them the blessings of God comes back in and uh, kind of characterizes the situation so just pay attention to the sorts of things that you see going on here um, there is there's liberation and there's righteousness and there's justice and there is comfort and there is restoration healing um, there is peace and there is plenty and there is um, I want to say abundance and and there are um, all manner of things and so what you find like I said I just want to kind of give an overview today what you find is uh, as you go throughout the prophets and they talk about this future time you start to see many of these uh, sorts of themes uh, repeat over and over and over again when the kingdom comes, it's going to be a time where righteousness overtakes unrighteousness. It's going to be a time where comfort overtakes grief. It's going to be a time where peace overtakes mourning. It's going to be a time where justice outweighs injustice. It's going to be a time where uh, healing um, kind of overpowers brokenness. It's going to be a time where abundance overtakes scarcity. And um, this is very similar to what, for instance, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. Uh, the Beatitudes in and of themselves are not prescriptions for earning, like getting God's blessings. And so it's not a formula like if you will only be poor in spirit, um, then God will bless you. That's not what the Beatitudes are doing. Um, it is rather a description of what God is doing. And these kinds of people are blessed because of what God is doing. As a matter of fact, um, oh... I can't remember, Glenn Stassen, I was trying to remember the guy's name, Glenn Stassen in his book on the Sermon on the Mount, um, Living the Sermon on the Mount is the name of it, if you want to look at it, he makes a really convincing argument that the text Jesus is preaching from in Isaiah, or in Matthew chapter 5 of the Beatitudes is Isaiah 61, which would make sense because if you go over to Luke chapter 4, when Jesus preaches his first sermon in Luke, he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth and he reads from Isaiah 61. Um, and so um, the Beatitudes become this description of what God is doing. Those of you who are poor in spirit, which was a, a way of referring to the Anawim. Uh, sometimes we talk about, you know, oh, the poor in spirit means to be humble. One of the things I want you to wrestle with is there is a vast difference between being humble and being humbled. Being humble is a virtue. Being humbled, being pressed down, is um, very rarely a pleasant or a good or a fair thing. And we're not talking about humble people when we talk about the poor in spirit and the Beatitudes. We're talking about those who have been humbled by the Persians, by the Babylonians, by the Romans, by the rich, by those with power and influence, by life's circumstances. They are the ones without hope. He says, you are blessed now because God 
is acting. And when God comes and is present and acts, then uh, what you're going to find is that hopelessness gives way to hope. He, he's acting on your behalf. Uh, he brings out that uh, the notion of comfort that Isaiah 61 spends a lot. Blessed are those who mourn. Not because there's some virtue in mourning. Um, not because the circumstances over which we mourn are things that God intended. Um, but rather because God is, Jesus says, bringing comfort. You are blessed because now God is acting to bring comfort into the brokenness of the world. And so on and so forth we can go. Uh, the Beatitudes, they line up with um, what Isaiah 61 is announcing about God. And so, um, what does it look like to follow the God who is doing these sorts of things? And the short answer that I want us to wrestle with um, over the next few weeks as we look at the Gospel according to Isaiah, which I think is what we're going to do, um, is to say simply that we know where God is at in the situation. God has made very clear where he's at in the situation. He's out in the broken places of the world where there are those who are without hope, those who are grieving, those who uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is just a way of saying they, they have this acute sense that there ought to be more than what we have for ourselves in the world. God is out there in those places, and he's bringing hope. He's bringing comfort. He's uh, filling those who are looking for something more up with righteousness, um, the way things should be. He's giving them a vision of a better way of doing things. And he's out there making peace break out in the midst of violence. He's uh, breaking or bringing healing into the midst of brokenness. He's bringing justice into the midst of injustice. This is where God is. This is what God is doing. So the question is, um, not where is God, not what is God doing, but are we going to join God? And so uh, one of the things I want us to think about is that follow this kind of God into the world is to go into the world as agents of righteousness in the midst of unrighteousness. And we need to talk about what that means because we have a variety of ideas about what righteousness looks like. Or, or to be agents of justice when you talk about that too. Or to be agents of peace and we need to talk about that as well. Uh, but to be agents of healing, to be agents of joy, to be agents of comfort, to to be agents of abundance, to go into the world and to act in accordance with this world that God is creating as the one who is present and who hears uh, the cry of those in the darkness. This is what it means to be a light in the midst of the darkness. This is what it means to do our good deeds, as Jesus would say later on in chapter 5, right after talking about we are the light of the world. Uh, do our good deeds before men so that they may see them and give glory to the Father. We're to live our lives in such a way that we point to the reality that God is creating in his kingdom where he's setting things right as the one who hears the cry. And so um, we're going to talk about this more as we go. I want to kind of kind of settle in and, and ask what does it mean to pursue righteousness or to pursue justice or to pursue peace or healing or joy or comfort um, those sorts of things as we go because this is what it looks like this is what our church should look like you know sometimes we get in conversations with the church of christ uh, you know these are the marks of the church and we'll talk about a variety of doctrinal things but what i'm interested in i think what god is interested in is um the marks of a healthy church is are your group of people where when you rub up against the broken world righteousness breaks out and joy breaks out and peace breaks out and justice breaks out and redemption breaks out and healing breaks out and then people can respond to that as they will some will not have any time for that others will um, be inspired to be compelled to pursue God because of that but uh, we are the ones who bring those elements into the world and so we'll talk about what that means more as we go so right now we're just under 25 minutes um, just a reminder if it's not obvious this is not live pre-recorded but leave a comment down below if you have questions if you have additions if you have subtractions and we will keep trucking from there and who knows maybe at some point in the next month or so next several weeks we can actually start doing this live we can have conversation instead of me talking at a screen you walk watching the screen and then us texting back and forth uh, wouldn't it be grand all right you guys have a great week. Stay dry. Talk to you later.